Uh, welcome to this session for English language teachers. I've been asked by ePublic Korea to make a session based on practical reading activities for teaching young learners. My name is Will Lashett. I've been working in ELT for 20 years now. I actually taught English in Hagwons and universities in Korea from 2001 to 2006, and I now work as an academic consultant and teacher trainer for National Geographic Learning, and I'm based in Singapore. So the agenda. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about scaffolding and how we can support our students. Next, I'll talk briefly about the stages of a reading lesson. And finally, the main part of the session will focus on practical activities that you can use in the classroom. So let's start with scaffolding. The predecessor of scaffolding was Vygotsky's Zone of Proximal Development which he wrote about in the 1930s. So this idea was that there was a distance between what a child could do and what they wanted to do. And this could be facilitated by a knowledgeable other or a teacher who could support them in a way that they could achieve this next step. But learning had to take place in this zone that was at the right level of difficulty. Next, uh, Jerome Bruner. So Bruner's work in the 60s and 70s tells us that learners are capable of learning pretty much anything as long as the instruction is structured correctly and that the students are supported in the right way. This is the idea of scaffolding. Bruner also proposed the spiral curriculum, which means revisiting content at regular intervals so that students can revise, learn and master it. So each time um, the content is revisited, it is taught at a slightly higher level. So in this way, students are supported. Here are a few direct quotes uh, from the Wikipedia article on scaffolding, which provide the, provide the main points. So scaffolding is the support given to a student by an instructor. It could be employed by modeling a task, giving advice and or providing coaching. And scaffolding is gradually removed as students develop autonomy. So this means that certain techniques, tasks or activities require much more modeling and explanation the first time we use them. But once the students are used to the task, they can complete the task by themselves. So a key idea linked to scaffolding is Krashen's input hypothesis from 1977. So take a look at this image here and see if you can guess what I plus one means. If we have 100 steps in front of us, we cannot jump from the bottom to the top. It's impossible, but it's fairly easy to walk slowly up the staircase one step at a time. And that is the essence of the input hypothesis. It states that learners progress in their knowledge of the language when they comprehend language input that is slightly more advanced than their current level. Krashen called this level of input I plus one, where I is the learner's interlanguage and plus one is the next stage of language acquisition. In summary, it means don't give an advanced text to an elementary learner, or to put it another way, an A1 level student is not going to learn very much from a high level C2 text. As a visual aid, if we think about the scaffolding we see on a construction site, we know that it enables the workers to add one level of the building at a time. And just as in construction, Okay, in education, students can build their language knowledge when they have a strong foundation. But if students don't have a strong foundation, if they don't know enough of the language or if the task is too challenging, what happens? The task will fail or the student will fail to learn. And in terms of reading, if the text and the task are too hard or too difficult, then the activity will fail. So as a general rule, if the text is too hard, we can adjust the task. So I'll say that again, okay? Adjust the task, not the text. 
we can make it more suitable. So it's much easier for the teacher and that way students can still complete a task. Uh, this is really important in classes where we have mixed ability students. We can differentiate by using adapted tasks, but it's very difficult for us to find a completely new text, especially when we're using a book, a textbook. Um, also remember that students don't have to understand every word in a text. Um, if they can complete the task that you have set, they are achieving something. Before we move on, uh, here are two types of scaffolding. So scaffolding can include basically reviewing what has, is already known and building on this, um, as we discussed in the spiral curriculum. Um, students need to meet language many times before they're able to use it correctly. And secondly, scaffolding prepares the learner for what comes next. So usually scaffolding gets students ready for and supports them for the upcoming task. And that brings me to the next section of my talk. So secondly, we're gonna talk about the stages of a reading lesson. So as you probably know, there are three main stages in a reading lesson. We have pre-reading that can prepare students for a text by teaching vocabulary or the concepts that they need. We have the main reading task itself, which can be scaffolded, and should be at the correct level. And we have post-reading tasks, which reinforce what's been learnt, which helps with memory and retention. Today, I'm going to give you some tips for pre-reading, and I'm going to show you activities which might be used at any of these three stages. So let's start with pre-reading. So how do we get students ready to read? The first step is to generate interest in the topic. And this is really, really important. If students are interested, they will try harder and they will learn more. So how can we do that? Well, there are many things we can do. We can show a picture. We can tell an interesting anecdote or story. We can show a video. We can use realia, bring things into the lesson. We can sing a song. We can get creative and we can use a variety of techniques to hook our students and grab their attention. Next, we need to activate their background knowledge. So we need to get students thinking about the topic. We can use their own experience. We can personalize the topic. We can ask them questions. We can get them to discuss. We can share ideas. Next, we need to pre-teach the key vocabulary. So not all of the vocabulary, but certain words that they need to get the main points. So you could dictate key words, you could do a dictionary race, you could do a fun game like backs to the board. Again, you can use a variety of techniques in different lessons. Next, we're gonna predict what they will see in the reading. To predict, you have to engage with the content and it requires critical thinking skills. Again, you can use pictures, you can show them the title, you can show them the key vocabulary, you can show them a video, you can ask them questions. So anything that gets their attention and gets them thinking about what might be in that text. And making prediction leads into my final tip, which is give them a reason to read. So in real life, we read for a reason. So maybe it's for pleasure, but it's definitely not just because the teacher tells us that we have to read something. Um, in real life, okay, a common reason for reading is to find information uh, because we're curious about something, um, or maybe you want to check that what we think is correct. We often use the internet for this, right, to find things out. Um, so if students have made predictions, they've already invested something in the text. And if they've made a prediction, they instinctively want to find out if they were right. Um, it also personalizes the task because students will be looking for something in the text that they specifically want to know. They will have an individualized, personal reason to read. So that's the theory and the tips done. So we're going to move on now to a demonstration of the activities. So here are the activities. You probably know some of these, but I hope to give you some extra tips on how to use them effectively. Uh, most of these are actually integrated skills activities, but they're all based off a reading passage. So they're great add-ons to reading lessons as a great way 
to either introduce or revisit or revise a text. So first is the Joyce dictation. So step one of a Joyce dictation is to pre-teach the key vocabulary from the text. So how many words you use depends on the level of your students and how old they are. So fewer words is obviously easier. You have to decide whether you want students to work alone or in groups. I think if you're working online, it's probably easier to get students to work alone for this stage. So the first step is you're going to read the five to 10 words, the, the, the key words. And the first time you read them to the students, the students are just going to listen. Okay, so there's no pens. Okay, they have their book shut and they're just listening, hands down on the table, just listening. So let's try that. Okay, so you can just listen to the words. All right, so the words are twins, look alike, same, different, loud, quiet, both, and clever. The second time students listen and they're going to repeat. OK, so let's try that. OK, I'm going to read. I want you to listen and then repeat. OK, so let's try that again. Twins. Look alike. Same. Different. Loud. Quiet. Both. Clever. OK, now the third time we do this, it's exactly the same. Students listen and repeat. Uh, I'm not going to do it again, OK, because we don't need to do it for a third time in the demonstration. Um, so after the third time, students have heard the words three times and they've said them twice, but their hands have been down on the table. They haven't written anything. The next stage is, and we can try this as well, um, you can pause the recording if you need to, so we get the students with a pen and paper ready. OK, now uh, you can type into your phone or your computer, OK, if that's what you're using. I want you to write down, OK, all the eight words that we just said, the eight words that you repeated after me. And we're looking for correct spelling. I would give my students two or three minutes to do this. You can pause the video, OK, if you're doing it right now. Um, give yourself two minutes, okay? Uh, once students have finished, um, if they're working individually, they can check with a partner, okay, and see how many words they got. Or if you're doing it, as I like to do it, as a competitive group activity, um, you can then get students, you can swap their pieces of paper, okay? Um, and you can actually get them to mark it themselves, right? They can mark each other's paper, they can give allocate points so we can see which group is the winner. You could also do this in breakout rooms if you're using Zoom, okay? They could each give, send the teacher a list, they could put them into the chat box, teacher can give out points. Um, you can also do this as a competition online. So let's check the answers together. Okay, here are the words. Um, I wonder how many of those you got. Um, so once we've actually looked at the words, we know we've got the words right, we've got the spellings right, we can talk about a little bit about what the words mean, okay, the meanings of the words. We could discuss things like the parts of speech, how to use the words. Um, and the next thing that I would do with the Joyce Dictation is I would ask students to predict what the article is about, what the reading is about. So students are going to go back into with a partner or in a group and they're going to discuss what do they think this reading is about. If they find this difficult, okay, um, the prediction, uh, one thing you can do, which is a nice idea, is to actually show students the image that accompanies the reading. So this makes it much easier to predict, but it also helps it helps students to understand the target language. For example, here we can use the image to help with the concept. So we can ask questions like, who are these two girls? Okay, are they friends or are they sisters? Do they look the same or do they look different? OK, and we'll probably get from that. Yes, they look the same. OK, we think they're probably sisters or something like that. We can ask further questions Okay, to do with this word here. OK, do they have the same birthday 
Okay, are they the same age? Okay, well, if the answer is yes, then this means that they are twins. They're the same age, they're sisters, they have the same birthday. We can also look at a phrase like look alike, okay, and we can say uh, it means to look the same, okay, we can use the word here, right, we can ask more questions here, do you think that they're both loud, okay, do you think they're both quiet, do you think they're both clever, so here we're actually getting students to make, essentially make predictions, okay, about the reading, using the words in there. So after this stage, we're going to listen or we're going to read. OK, we're going to read the text and we're going to ask students to uh, to read it twice. OK, the first time they read, they're going to check their predictions. And the second time they read, they're going to read the text to find any other difficult words that they might have found in the text. We can uh, help them to understand those. And maybe if you want to do it a third time, you could either ask comprehension questions or even better, you could get students to write their own comprehension questions. So here is the text, okay, so you can have a quick look in there um, after the predictions maybe that you made. Uh, if you want to do that, if you want to read it, you can pause the video for a second. I want to talk a little bit about how word choice is important for the Joyce dictation. So uh, actually you can vary the task quite a lot by choosing different words. So I picked key content words that helped you understand the main idea of the reading, but you could actually disguise the main idea and make it much harder to guess. So if you do that, you could make it a competition. Uh, you could see which group can be the most creative with their predictions. You can see which group are the closest to the actual uh, meaning of the reading. Um, and of course, after the prediction task, uh, we've given our students a reason to read that I mentioned earlier. So after they've made their predictions, they're going to read, they're going to check to see if their ideas were correct. I think it's a good idea to combine your word choice for the Joyce dictation with a vocabulary exercise to reinforce and recycle the words. So here is the vocab exercise from this lesson. And here are the words that I chose. And if you look at this, if, if you check the words in here, you will see that I chose some of these words, but not all of them. Um, if I had chosen exactly the same words, it means that when they come to do this activity, it's, it's easy because they know what the words are, they're here. But this way, because I've only chosen some of them, they're going to have to check all of the words because they know that they're not all the same. OK, um, but because they know some of them okay, that we've already looked at, it should make the task more manageable for them. We've already discussed some of the meanings. OK, um, also notice here that if I had picked all of the target vocab in the box there, the prediction activity would be more difficult because they haven't chosen to use the word twins here. So I wanted, I deliberately wanted that because I thought it would make it easier to make the predictions. Okay, so here is the original spread, okay, as you can be found, um, and this is from a, a program called Wonderful World. Let's move on to the second activity. So this is one of my favorites. It's called Snake Stories. And this is uh, very easy to make as the teacher. So you just take part of a reading text and you remove the punctuation and the spaces like this. And now what students have to do, they have to read the text and they have to find out what it says. So it's actually very intensive reading. It's kind of similar to doing a word search. So single lines like this are great for younger learners at low levels. Um, if you make it longer, um, it makes it much more challenging. If it's too difficult, you can give them a clue, okay, like this. So I wonder if you can guess what these numbers represent. We've got eight and two. So this, of course, means that there are eight words in here and there are two sentences, okay? So that is some information that's going to help them to write out uh, the sentences there. Or another thing we could do, we could actually give them the punctuation that they need. So here we've got two full stops or two periods, if you prefer, and we've got three capital letters. So basically the task is students have to rewrite the text. And this is what you can do it by yourself. I'm sure you can work out what that says. Um, I've done it for you here. They are a family. They are from Canada. Okay, so very simple sentences. 
variation I like to use is uh, I call it odd word out. So hidden in here, there are two words that should not be there. Can you find them? So you, if you want, you can pause again, you can have a look. Can you identify the two words that should not be in the text? I'll give you a few seconds to look at that. OK, let's see the first one. So the first word that shouldn't be there is the word banana. But why is banana wrong? So we know it's wrong, but why? OK, so firstly, it's completely out of context. There's no other mention of a fruit in here. So it's a little strange to see the word banana. But also we can see that the grammar is wrong. So we know that when we use the, the verb look, OK, we're going to use the preposition at, OK, which is here actually, but um, we can't just say look banana. And we also know that um, before the word banana, OK, we're going to use uh, an article, right? So it would be a banana or the banana, which we don't have. So we know that the grammar is wrong. Uh, so banana is clearly wrong here. Um, what is the other word that shouldn't be here? It's a little bit more difficult. The second word that should not be here, the second odd word out is super. But why is super wrong? So it's definitely not as obvious as banana. Um, it's not grammatically wrong, is it? So we can use the adjective super to describe a person. So we can say, look at the super girl. That's fine. But the problem here is that it doesn't fit the structure of the text. So none of the other people in here, um, when we say look at the woman, there's no adjective there. Look at the man. There's no adjective there. Look at the boy. No adjective. So it's out of place. It doesn't fit the structure of the text. So it doesn't belong here. Once we've identified these words, okay, the next step is to ask students to write the story out, um, the story or the text, uh, with the gaps and with the punctuation. Now, when we look at that, this is actually not an easy task. That's quite a difficult task. Um, so we might need to make this easier for them. So we could do what I suggested before by giving them the number of words or sentences or punctuation. But in a longer text like this, it's going to be a lot of punctuation. So what I'd recommend we do here uh, you can change the way you present the text to make it less challenging. So we're now basically going to swap over to a writing task. OK, so it's integrated skills. Uh, students are still reading but they're, and decoding the sentences, but they're also going to be writing. So this is how I'm going to present it to make it easier. So we've sep I've separated it into individual lines. And actually, if I switch from here back to here, we can see that it, it's much easier, okay, in this form. And this is what I meant earlier by adapting the task, not the text. So I'm using exactly the same text, but this is a far more difficult task, even though it's a very similar task. So if you have mixed ability students in your class, you can easily make two versions of this on Word. It, it just it literally takes a minute to, to make this. And uh, you can give this task to the stronger students and you can give this task to the weaker students. So it's great for differentiation. For a more targeted task, OK, you can leave out something in particular that you want to practice. So in this case, I have uh, just really left out the periods, the full stops here. Um, so that's what students are going to be focusing on. So they're just separating these short sentences and adding full stops. Um, this is really great practice in this case for uh, punctuation, uh, but also for practicing the structure of writing a paragraph. So here is the final, the final product okay, that they will come up with. This is what they're aiming for. And I'm just going to make one more suggestion. If we go back to that adjective that I added earlier, um, once they've written out their paragraph, uh, one thing you can do is you can ask them, you can ask them to add in an extra adjective for each of the people in the photograph. Okay, so this is going to personalise the activity a little bit. Um, it's giving them some practice of uh, using adjectives to describe nouns, um, recycling some of the vocabulary they've learned, and it gives them a, a, an opportunity for some creativity. So we might end up with something like this. So with a snake story activity, we've gone from reading skills at a word level OK, then we've done editing. We've done word context and text style, uh, which words don't belong. We've moved on to writing skills. We've done sentence and paragraph structure. 
We've done punctuation and we've also done some creative input by asking them to add their own ideas. So I think this is really a fantastic activity. It's really easy to make and easy to do with any text that you're using. So I hope you can uh, enjoy using that one. And uh, this is the original spread uh, from Wonderful World. So you can see how it is presented in the book. And um, actually, once you've done the writing task, students can actually compare their writing with the original reading. Um, this, just comparing them and make, correcting theirs, it requires very close reading, and it really helps with grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Okay, so we're now going to move on to activity number three, which is speed reading. And I'm going to give you a short amount of time to read. Okay, so I'm going to show you a text and give you a very short amount of time to read. Okay, then what we would have to do is tell me the answer to the question or you would share with a partner. So I'm going to give you literally one second to answer this question. Okay, the question is, what is this reading about? So let's have a countdown, okay? If you've got the book at home with this text, you're going to close the book, okay? You can't see it and not allowed to see it. Okay, let's have a countdown. So what is this reading about? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, there we go. I have given you a very short amount of time to answer the question. So what was it about? Okay, what did you see? So you're probably sitting there thinking it's about penguins, right? And some of you might have even said it's about emperor penguins. And some of you might have even got to the part about them living in the Antarctic, okay? Um, so this is what the students will be discussing, and we'll see that actually students will get more, okay, than you expect them to get. Uh, let's try another question. Um, you might find the first time you do this after a second, your students are, oh, they're in uproar, teacher, teacher, it's too difficult. So you, you can show them again and give them a little bit longer, okay, until that they've got it. Okay, next, we're going to move on to another question, okay? So next question, can penguins fly? Okay, ready? Two seconds. Okay, can they fly? And you probably saw that they can't. Okay, so they can't swim, but what can they do? What can penguins do? And one of my very clever students is going to tell me they can swim, they can swim really well. Okay, so what we could do if you want to make it a bit more challenging, you could not give them the exact word. So rather than saying, can they fly, we could say something like, can they run? Okay, because then when they're looking for the answer, they'll be looking for the word run. And they need to make that leap that run, okay, is a type of movement, which is connected to flying or swimming, okay? So when they see fly and swim, there's no run there, okay, they would assume no, they don't run, okay? So we can, uh, yeah, we can make it more challenging in this way. Okay, next question for you. Are penguins good parents? Okay, I'm going to give you three seconds for this one. One, two, three. Okay, so are they good parents? So you probably got the answer. Um, you might not have done. Okay, let's have a look, all right? So if you were looking for the word good, okay, just as I said a minute ago, you're not going to find it, but we can see this word here, great, right? So I just did exactly what I, I said you could do. Um, we're looking for a word linked to this. So it's more challenging, so we'd give more time. Okay, let's do a couple more questions. How many kilometers does the female penguin walk? Okay, I'm going to give you four seconds. Okay, that was an easy one because it's a number, okay, and you probably saw straight away 80. In fact, I probably could have given you less time there. Okay, another question, a bit more difficult. Why does the mother penguin come back? Okay, why does the mother penguin come back? Okay, I'm going to take the text away. Okay, maybe you got the answer there. Maybe you didn't. Okay, um, but this is where you get them in groups. You get them discussing. Okay, and they, they find it really exciting. I like to give points out okay, to the first person who can give me the answer. Okay, let's check. So why does the mother penguin come back? Okay, so we can see here. Um, 
uh, because the chick comes out of the egg and the mother comes back with food. Okay, so the reason is that the mother comes back to feed the chick. Okay, I actually missed out one of the questions there, which was uh, she stays away for two months. I should have asked you that first. I forgot. Um, so she comes back after two months to feed the chick, right? Okay, last question for you. How does the father feel when the mother penguin comes back? Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, take it away. How does the father penguin feel? And I'm sure you can all tell me that he is extremely hungry because he's been there for two months without eating anything. Okay, so speed reading. Okay, I think really nice activity. Um, here is the original spread from Wonderful World. We've got that lovely image of the uh, emperor penguins here, absolutely beautiful birds. And we've got the text here. So let me give you a few tips for doing this activity. Um, I think it's great as a kind of light-hearted and entertaining hook. Uh, we need to make sure we set it up correctly. And in this case, we need to be absolutely sure that we've explained the task before we give them the text, okay? I mean, if we're teaching online like this, it doesn't matter because you are controlling when they see the text. But if you are in the classroom, then um, don't go and hand out the paper, okay, and then try and explain what you're doing because guaranteed, as soon as you say, don't look at the reading, everyone's going to look at the reading. Um, in fact, it's one of the interesting things about doing speed reading. As soon as we tell students that they're not allowed to read the text, that's all they want to do. They want to read the text. Um, usually, you know, students, they don't want to read anything that we give them, but as soon as we say, don't read it, they want to read it. Um, <laughs> so that's really good. Um, it's a little bit of reverse psychology. Uh, so here are my tips. We need to make sure that we generate interest, okay, by restricting access to the text. Uh, as I said, it's reverse psychology. And um, yeah, basically, um, when we don't want them to read, they read. When we want them to read, they often don't read. Next, set the activity up carefully. If you're using paper, make a big deal, okay, of putting the paper face down on the desk, okay? If you're using books, make sure the books are closed, okay? Uh, they can put their finger, okay, at the right page, but make sure it's definitely closed and they can't see the text, right? Make sure you explain the rules really carefully. Uh, make sure you're strict, but be dramatic. Don't allow them to look. Uh, make sure they only look for the right amount of time. So make sure you're really running around saying, no, close your book, close your book. Um, because it adds to the kind of energy of the activity. And your students, to begin with, they'll be absolutely outraged, right? How good, you didn't give us enough time, teacher. And they will protest. They will say it's impossible. But this is all part of the activity. It's all part of the fun and the engagement and the motivation of the activity. Uh, giving them the countdown, okay, helps with this. Next, set a short time limit and increase this later. So to begin with, we're only asking for very simple information. Uh, first couple of questions basically only require single word answers from the first line of text. But as the questions get more difficult, more complicated, we need to give them more time each time. The point of this activity really is to encourage students to scan quickly to find information. And reading speed is something that almost all of our students lack. OK, so often our students are good at comprehension, but they lack reading speed. And when they come to high level exams, OK, uh, international exams, this is where our students have problems that they can't read fast enough. So here we're encouraging them to read fast and we're not getting them to read every word on the page, which is what our students will naturally want to do. They know they can't because they really don't have enough time. So it, we're illustrating to them basically how to scan read, and it's a fun way of doing it. Lastly, we get our students to share what they've learned, and often we will find that we're surprised. I've done this with primary students, and they far exceeded my expectations when I first started using this activity. I was so surprised as to how many of the answers they would get, especially as, because remember, if you've got 20 students, that's 20 pair of eyes. So collectively, they can do it faster than you can as a teacher because they've got more pairs of eyes on it. So they, they, they you know, and they, they really feel a sense of accomplishment if they're the first one to get it. And um, so heap praise upon them when they get the answers right. Okay, next we're moving on to text rebuild. And um, 
this is kind of a general term. I'm going to show you a few different activities, three different activities. So the first one we're going to do is focusing on text at a word level. Next, we're going to focus on sentences, and then we're going to focus on paragraphs. So the first one is a gap fill. And I know uh, that a gap fill is not a groundbreaking activity, but if we make them thoughtfully and if we make them well, they can be a fantastic way to focus on the meaning of words through context. OK, so this is a really important reading skill. OK, being able to identify the meaning by looking at other words. Yeah. So here I've taken another reading from Wonderful World and I've chosen and omitted or left out words very carefully. So take a minute to think about what the missing words might be and why you think I chose these particular words to remove. OK, so you can pause while you read that and have a think about what the missing words are. And I am going to read the passage out. So in the wild, there are big cats. There are lions, mm, jaguars, leopards, and cheetahs. These big cats are in danger. They're having a hard time getting, mm, they are starving to death. In some places, hungry cats hunt livestock, like cows and mm, want to protect their animals. So they're the big cats that hunt them. So let's try it. So number one, what are the contextual clues here? So the first clue is in the previous sentence, big cats. And then in the second sentence, we have a list, lions, something, jaguars, leopards, and cheetahs. We know it's a list because of the commas, okay? I removed one of the most famous types of big cat to make it easier. So which one is missing from the list? OK, it begins with a T. It's obviously the word tiger. So by drawing their attention to this word tiger, I'm actually teaching them some new words here because they probably know lion and tiger, but they probably don't know jaguar, leopard and cheetah. But from the context here, they can understand that it's a list. OK, so. These, even if they don't know the words, they must be types of big cat. So by removing this word, I'm teaching them three new words. Number two, these big cats are in danger. So something bad is happening. They are having a hard time getting something. Okay, a hard time getting something. So think about what do big cats need? Okay, what do they need to... Uh, to, to enjoy their lives or to have a good life. The next sentence tells us that they're starving to death. And our students probably don't know this word starving. So we can continue to the next sentence. In some places, hungry cats want livestock, hunt livestock. So this word they do know. They know the word hungry. And let's go back. OK, it says they're having a hard time getting something. So a hard time getting what? If they're hungry, it must be a hard time getting something to eat. It must be getting food. So now we know that they don't have food. We can elicit the meaning of starving. OK, if you don't have food, what happens to you? You die. OK, so why do you die from a lack of food? It's because, well, the word that we, we, we call it is starving. So we can elicit this from our students. OK, number three, hungry cats hunt livestock. Here we go. In some places, hungry cats hunt livestock. So they probably don't know this word, but it explains it to us like cows and something. So we know the word cow. OK, where do you find cows? We find them on a farm. OK, what else do you find on a farm? Oh, we find chickens. We find sheep. We find goats. Uh, we find pigs. So this word is probably one of those words. It's a farmyard animal, right? An animal we find on a farm. So we can pick one and put it in there. Number four. Someone wants to protect their animals. OK, someone. Now, who might that be? So who looks after cows and sheep or chickens? OK, who is it who looks after them? Who protects their animals? Cow could be a cowboy. OK, probably not. It's probably going to be a farmer. So they're mm, OK, they so they is talking about the farmers. OK, they are doing something to the big cats that hunt them. OK, so what do we think the farmers do 
when they see big cats who are killing their animals? How would they stop the cat? Okay. Remember, back here it says that they're in danger. Okay, the cats are in danger. So, what do the farmers do? Are they chasing the cats? Are they killing them? Okay. Are they shooting them? Okay. What do you think? So, approaching the text in this way, we're encouraging students to find contextual clues in the text to make educated educated predictions for what the missing words are. And actually, it doesn't matter if they get some of these words wrong. Um, in fact, let's check the answers and see. So, for example, if one of my students chose for number five, if they chose the word shooting, which is a word I just said, it's not wrong, right? We would say, actually, I would praise my student. That's great because they probably are shooting them, right? How do farmers kill big cats? It's probably with a gun, right? So we could say, well, that it's not the answer in the text, but it is a correct answer. If they use the word kill, if they put so they kill the big cats, again, we wouldn't say it was wrong. We would say you are right. You got the correct word. OK, the correct vocabulary. This is really a vocabulary exercise. But let's have a look at the other words around it, it says they are. OK, and this is something that's happening all the time. It's a process. Right. So we would say this should be the present continuous tense. It should have ing. OK, so we can explain it to our students. If my student wrote, uh, let's say for number two, okay, if they wrote pray, okay, they are having a hard time getting pray. So they, you know, they might have looked up in their dictionary, they might have translated from their mother tongue, and they might have got this word pray. So again, I would be very happy that they got that word, even if they translated it from their mother tongue, it shows initiative, and it shows an understanding of the text, right? So what we might say to them is, well, yes, that's great. That's a good word. Um, although we don't usually say get prey. OK, we might use another word, a better collocation. We might say catch. We usually say catching prey or even finding prey. OK, but I mean, it's acceptable. It's definitely acceptable to say get prey. OK, but if we're using the specialist word prey, we could probably ta uh, teach them catch, OK, to catch your prey, stronger collocation. So we can see this activity is about vocabulary, using context clues and grammar to help us predict individual words. OK, next one, we're looking at sentence cut ups, focusing on sentences. So I'm not going to spend much time on this one, um, but it can be a good activity. Uh, so we need to make sure we're, make, we're not making it too difficult and that there is an actual point to the activity. Um, I've included it here because I've seen lots of teachers use it. And actually myself, I've used it um, a lot of times uh, when I started teaching. I used it very badly. Um, I made it very, very difficult and there wasn't really much point to it. So I want to show you a couple of things you can do to make it a better activity. Um, I actually prefer the gap fill or the activity I'm going to show you later. Uh, but in my opinion, if you're going to use this activity, um, you need to use it carefully. So firstly, if sentences are very long, OK, it becomes very, very difficult to do. Um, if you've got more than like eight words, let's say you've got 12 words, something like that, quite a long set, it's very, very difficult. Even for native speakers, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, even with a shorter sentence like this, OK, seven words. It's also very difficult, and I'm going to show you why. So look at this sentence here, and I want you to put this into the correct answer. OK, so what should this sentence be? All right, I'll give you a few seconds, or you can pause if you like. Um, so you might have thought of a, a sentence like this. There are big cats in the wild, right? OK, so looks great, right? Looks good to me. Perfect. Um, but another group might have put in the wild, there are big cats, OK? So again, yep, uh, that looks good to me as well. No problem. One group might have big cats are there in the wild. Uh, yeah, OK, so maybe, yeah, I think that it look, looks OK, right? The big cats in there are wild. OK, so I think you can begin to see my point here. Do we want to get involved in this? Do we want to start with our young learner students, OK, at a low level? Do we want to start getting into this grammar nitty gritty okay there are wild big cats in there are there big cats in the wild so from these seven words i've got six different possibilities now of course we can say perhaps some of these should have some punctuation in there should have a comma but it's getting very complicated um i think 
this activity that we've just done here, this would be a good activity for making the point about the flexibility of English, maybe about sentence structure, but it's much too open-ended and it probably doesn't help our students very much. Um, this might be useful for a kind of advanced grammar lesson, but not for our young learners, right? So what can we do? To start with, very easy, we can just make sure we give some punctuation. It massively reduces the options and it also teaches them about punctuation. So our students are much more likely to be able to find the correct answer. And I think really for our young learners, we want there to be a definite answer. We don't want it to be ambiguous. So they're probably going to find the answer in the wild. There are big cats. Uh, they might come up with in there are the big wild cats, but we could say to them, well, here really we should put a comma. Okay, this I think it is grammatically possible, but you know, it's not it's not as good, is it? It's not as clean a sentence as the first one. Okay, second point. If you have very long sentences, okay, break them down into chunks. OK, so this makes it much easier and it's a good way to differentiate between stronger and weaker students in one class. You can have two versions. Uh, when I did this, um, if I was in the classroom, I used to because I'd have several sentences. I did each sentence in a different color. So the first sentence would be on red paper, second sentence green, third sentence yellow, because otherwise, as soon as you give them the and they've taken off the paper, they get them mixed up. And then it's impossible to know which word goes where. OK, um, the other thing you should do um, on the first word, you should put a number. So you put like five uh, here four. So you'd write a four there so they know how many pieces there are. So they know they're not missing one. That's great if you're going to swap with different groups, different sentences for different groups. If we're doing it online, as many of you are, you can use OneNote, for example. So on OneNote, you can actually have chunks of text and you can actually drag them around, which makes it very easy. Um, or you can, uh, as I've done here, you can do it as a PowerPoint transition. So before I show you the transition, just have a go for me. Can you complete the sentence? OK, let's try. So we've got in the wild. There are big cats. OK, so we can have it as a nice little transition there. OK, moving on to paragraphs. So you've already seen this paragraph because I used it just now. Usually I wouldn't do the same text with a uh, for a gap fill and a sentence cut up. But this is just for demonstration. I want to make it easier. So here are some tips. So firstly, with a sentence cut up activity, don't be tempted to split the text into too many sentences. So just like with the words, if there are too many, it becomes very, very difficult. And um, there could be a variety of possibilities. We don't want this to be ambiguous. We want there to be a clear right answer. So what I've done is I've kept pairs of sentences together. Next, before students start the activity, read the title together highlight it big cats in danger and it's important that we keep that in mind okay as we read the sentences keep the title in mind you can take a few seconds now to read the sentences and put them in the right order uh, and think about how you do it so you can pause the video for a minute and just put these in the right order for me okay so i like to use a process of elimination so let's have a look together so we know from the title that sentence A is almost definitely not the first sentence in this paragraph. OK, why not? How do we know that? Well, because this sentence, sentence A, is about farmers, but the title is about big cats. So we're looking for the topic sentence. So this would be a very bad topic sentence, talking about farmers when the uh, topic of the paragraph is big cats. So we know that this isn't the right answer, so I'm going to cross this out. OK, how about B? Can B be the first sentence? Well, no, because it starts with a pronoun. It says they. So we know that we use pronouns to reference nouns that we've mentioned before. But this is the first sentence. So we cannot start a topic sentence with they. So it's not the right answer. Sentence D is similar. OK, it says these cats. OK, now these is a determiner and it's used to reference something already mentioned. But if it's the first sentence, we haven't mentioned anything. So this is the wrong answer. So by a process of elimination, we can see that we are left with C. In the wild, there are big cats. 
This introduces the main topic, okay, big cats. We can see that there. And it then goes on to give a list or examples of big cats. So I think that is a great topic sentence. I'm going to choose that one. There we go. So we can highlight the links here, right? So uh, we can show, okay, to our students, look, I'm choosing this because, okay, it's mentioning big cats right at the beginning. It matches the title. So we've covered half of the title. We haven't mentioned the second half, which is danger. So I think my next sentence is probably going to start bringing up this concept of danger, okay? So sentence D, okay, mentions this, it mentions danger here, and it also references big cats, these big cats, right? So which one specifically? Well, lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and cheetahs. So I think that that should go second. And I've highlighted danger here. And I've also shown here that these big cats, this is referencing big cats and the specific ones there. Uh, next, OK, we're going to look uh, for a thematic link, OK, with food. So food is mentioned at the end, hard time getting food. So which of these centers mentions food? OK, well, here we've got uh, starving. OK, and here we've got hungry. So although our students probably don't know starving, as we mentioned earlier, they will know the the word hungry. OK, so let's choose that sentence. And we can then. Uh, we can then show that food has a thematic link with hungry and with starving. And they, okay, is again referring back to these big cats. Okay, at the end of this sentence, we learn about livestock. We learn about cows and goat livestock. This means cows and goats. And we can see that in the following sentence, we've got here uh, farmers, okay, and they protect their animals. So if I can make a link here, I can show that farmers... Um, there's a link with livestock, with cows and goats, and here them links to animals, links to cows and goats. So we can see that this sentence cut up activity, they would be reordering them. It's really great for focusing on paragraph structure, especially how to link sentences and ideas together, um, and also how to reference. So this activity is all about coherence and cohesion, and this is really useful for raising awareness and prepare, for preparing students to write their own paragraphs. I think that's a great activity. Uh, my final activity, last one, is see, think, wonder. And there are three stages that can be done separately with feedback in between. So this is a good idea if students are unfamiliar with the activity. OK. It provides more scaffolding for them. However, once students have used the technique a few times before, it's better to get them to discuss all three stages at once, because this leads to a more natural discussion and requires fewer interruptions and only one feedback stage. So what is the activity? So basically, it's an activity that requires a reading text with an image. And the more striking and interesting the image is, the better. So first, we show the students the image but we hide the text and we ask students to, to tell us what they can see. So they're describing the image, okay? What's happening in the picture, okay? So they're just telling us what they can see. Next, we ask students to talk about what they think is happening. So for example, okay, what they think, ha what they think happened immediately before or after the, the picture was taken. Uh, they're making predictions. OK, and they think about why. Why is this happening? So this is they're giving their opinion. Right. Uh, this requires some critical thinking, making predictions. And this can be checked later in the reading. When they make these predictions, they'll check them later. And finally, uh, we're going to ask students to discuss what they would like to know about the photo. OK, so what are they curious about? What do they wonder? Um, and it's good to do this section as um, it's good to do this section because um, we're finding out what they're curious about. And once they've written their own questions, OK, once they've written questions, they can then check these later in the reading. OK, so this is giving them a real reason to read. So let's have a look at a lovely image, a striking image, and we can try this together. OK, so what can you see here? So I can see a river. I can see a sunset. I can see colored stone. OK, you can see lots of other things, OK, which you can describe. 
Next, what do we think? So I think that this might be the Grand Canyon. I think it looks very deep. Uh, I think it looks very hot here. Um, and I guess that this is sandstone. Okay, so these are my predictions. Next, what do I wonder? So I wonder how big this is. Um, I'd like to know what type of activities you can do here. And I'm curious to find out why the stone is so many different colors. Okay, so we can, this is our students are doing all these tasks. So the purpose of this activity is to raise interest, is to exploit their existing knowledge, and it's to make predictions and personalize and give a reason to read. When they're doing the speaking activity, I like to hand out uh, sentence stems, okay? So this is uh, basically scaffolding. So when they have these stems here, um, I give out laminated ones, but if you're teaching online, you can just put them on the screen like I've done here. And it means that they can focus on their ideas and not worry about the language, okay? So they can pick any sentence they want. I'm curious about the colors in the stone. Uh, I wonder why, I wonder if, um, I wonder how how uh, deep this is. So yeah, giving them the sentence stems helps to scaffold this. Okay, so once students have finished the activity, they can read the text and they can now, uh, they now have two authentic reasons to read. So they're looking in the reading text, firstly, to check their predictions from the I think stage. And secondly, they're looking to see if the things that they are curious about are really mentioned in the text. So I can see uh, that I was right. Um, I predicted it was the Grand Canyon and it is. Um, I can also learn about the activities. Like here, there's a skywalk. It says you can do a skywalk. It says you can go, um, I think it says you can explore on foot. So you can go hiking, you can go rafting. So this is what I wanted to know. What can we do there? And I found that out here. Um, and that sounds fun. And now I would love to go and visit the Grand Canyon. Uh, as I'm sure you would as well. Um, okay, so that is the last of my activities for you. So I'm just going to quickly recap what we have covered today. So we talked a little bit about what scaffolding is and why it's important, how we should support our students. We talked about the stages of a lesson and in particular pre-reading. And then I showed you lots of practical activities that you can use with any reading text. Here are the activities we looked at. And as I said earlier, they are all based off reading passages, although many of these are actually integrated skill activities. I think all of them are great add-ons to reading lessons as a great way to introduce a text, to revise a text, or to expand or extend a lesson based around a useful text. So thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you found that useful. Thanks to ePublic for inviting me to give the session using the great materials from Wonderful World. I've included my email here in case you'd like to get in touch with me or you have any questions. OK, so take care and have a great day. Hello everybody! Today, we'd like to introduce a new coursebook series, Boost Up. Boost Up is a comprehensive six-level English program for primary learners, motivating young learners to enhance their English proficiency through the use of CLIL-based learning content. It features extensive lessons designed for young learners to develop 21st century skills and become successful global citizens. The main target learners for Boost Up is primary level learners from grades 1 to 6. Hence, Boost Up is a primary coursebook that can be used as the follow-up series to open up. You will see the characters in Boost Up growing as the levels of the program increase. The characters reflect the learners themselves, thus it helps students to be immersed in situations of the books and use the expressions they learn in their real lives. Each character has a role of leading students to the specific activities. For instance, you can find Tom when the activities are for enhancing creativity, 
while May is found in the critical thinking activities. Our world is rapidly changing, and we believe that it is important that our learners be well prepared and qualified as global citizens and future leaders. This is the reason why the 21st century skills and topics based on content and language integrated learning, also known as CLIL, have been incorporated into the Boost Up series. The 21st century skills, or also simply known as the four C's, are collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creativity. As we shift our focus on teaching using the CLIL approach, we plan to gear towards content learning more than simple language practices. We believe that the four C's will enable students to be empowered, allowing them to successfully adapt to the 21st century. The four C's have been embedded in every lesson in the form of puzzles, role plays, class activities, show and tells, pair works, games, and so on. Teachers can use these activities accordingly to suit their classroom needs. Now let me introduce the Boost Up contents. The Boost Up series is divided into six main levels. Each book contains eight units, and each unit contains four lessons. Lesson 1 introduces the unit's main conversation through real-life expressions, followed by Lesson 2 and 3, which introduces the target vocabulary and target language through specific words and grammar. Lastly, Lesson 4 features a CLIL-based topic story aimed to recap the contents learned from the previous lessons. We truly believe that repetitive input with diverse and meaningful contexts will help learners expedite their learning process. Hence, we provide fun and easy to follow activities, catchy songs and chants with animations and videos, and a portfolio for practicing and boosting confidence in English. While you listen to the songs, pay close attention to the lyrics as it carries the six educational teacher. values of trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, directions. caring, and finally, a sense of citizenship. Rules. We have also included prep tests with essential vocabulary and grammar for Cambridge YLE tests. Language World's materials are teacher-friendly. We provide the teacher's manual, and other downloadable teacher resources such as mp3 files, flashcards, answer key, PowerPoint resources, syllabus, tests, and more. You can also access free online audio and videos. Link to the website will be provided in the comments section below. We hope that these interactive digital materials and web tools would lead to a lively classroom that engage your students and reinforce learning. Let the Boost Up series boost up the learner's global awareness while learning English and lead them to be global citizens of the 21st century.